All right, so at this point, what I've got here is um, a couple of sites that have been verified. Um, and the whole point of this, you might not see too much out of it early on because we've just set it up. This is not going to give you data from previous times. It's going forward. So that's why what we want to do is set this up as soon as we can so we can keep track of this data. So I'm going to go back to the search console, the main the main top screen here. And as you can see here, I've got a variety of clients that I've got set up here, so this can be pretty cumbersome. Um, and you can organize alphabetically, because the weird thing is it doesn't put it in the order. It puts it by property health, which I think is really worthless. It really doesn't work as advertised. I always switch over to alphabetically. This is optional. But now it's showing me this client with the WW and without it. So alphabetically, just so that I can find the clients. Also, it's showing me uh, with extra information, the picture, the address, maybe some status updates. If I, if I don't want to see that, you can change the view with that button, compact view. And it'll just quickly show you the address, no thumbnail, any quick messages here. So that's switching between the two. Let's say I'm going to look at a particular property on the right side. They should say manage property with a couple quick, uh, quick settings, such as delete property. If you want to remove this from Google for some reason, you can delete that. Uh, well, technically not remove it from Google, uh, remove it from the console here to keep track of the data. To really remove your content from Google, that's a much harder process, and actually pretty hard in the US. In, um, in the European Union, they have passed a law that if someone requests some stuff of theirs to be removed from Google, Google has to remove it. We have no such law in the US, even though Google is a US company. So I don't know if we're going to get one of those laws. I don't know if there's enough political will for it. But in Europe, they said, if I want something of mine from Google removed, Google remove it. And they will. They, Google put up a big fight, of course. They lost. And so if you're in the European Union, you can get your stuff removed from Google. In the US, not yet. Why would Google have a problem with that? Because it's harder for them. They have to go into all of their data and make sure they've scrubbed out every piece of your data. Because whatever it collects on you, it's collecting on a variety of sources. And so it, on one aspect, it's hard for them to delete everything that they have on you because it's just so spread out. And of course, the, the, the main uh, purposes of Google internally is, of course, to make money. Any company wants to make money. And so the more data it has on people, the more it can properly target and advertise people. So that could be one cynical reason also not to for them to do it. And um, then we've also got the button for add or remove users. This is a quick way to add more people to edit your site. I got a question, if I may. Uh -huh. um, when you were talking about um, being able to uh, hit areas. Can, can you break down areas you want to go to for zip codes, for example? No, this is not, this screen is not about that. If you want to target individual zip codes and such, that's going to be the discussion about AdWords, okay. to be able to make ads and target them to particular audiences, but it's not this. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, I've got a few properties here. Um, on your property, your website, go ahead then and click on its name. Uh, well, we've got the WW version and the non-WW. So, we I've set the w, the non-W version as to as to be the preferred one. So I would on, periodically check the data for both, but for the moment I'll start on the non-W one. And what I mean periodically is it's a good idea to log into this once a month, and uh, and check things out in the way that I'm going to tell you. So I'm going to click on my property, my website here, and I'm going to get some data. Mine is on two lines, yours is on one because you've got wider screen. But new and important, no new messages or critical issues. If there are critical issues, I want to view them and fix them. Depending on what issue it is, it'll give you a tutorial of what's wrong for you to fix. So great, Google's going to keep an eye on my website so that it shows up properly on search. And if there's any problem, it'll tell me. There's a whole current status section, crawl errors, site errors, 
URL errors. Oh, it says that there might be 12 broken links, perhaps. So, quick look here also, it says that these aspects of the server are running well. If you get any X's there, um, we, we can look up how to fix it. But again, the longer you have this running and it's keeping track of your site, the more then we get this data that will help us. So I'll look at each of these screens in detail in a moment, but we've got crawl errors, search analytics. So briefly here it tells me within my latest time period I've had this number of clicks to my site. It'll tell us more detail in a moment. And then site map. The, this, is what it, this is what it knows about my site at the moment. There are 52 links on my site and 26 of them have been indexed or saved. You don't need to have every, in, every address indexed, every address saved on Google, because some of these links may be links over to someone else's website. We don't need that to be saved on our, on our profile, basically. So um, on the left side, we've also got a variety of screens, which we'll look at the important ones, but We've got search appearance, search traffic, Google index, crawl, security issues, other resources. So um, let's look at, do you see that little, uh, that little I for info on search appearance? Click on that I. This then gives you search appearance overview. This is what a typical Google search results page could look like. And it gives you tips on what to do to optimize yourself for this. So, for example, title, if you click How to Influence, write informative, relevant descriptions in the HTML title tag for each web page. Learn more. So, I get a page full of results. They obviously search for funny cats. And so they get a page of results. And that's your first impression right there. When, when you search, you've seen yourself probably, you search for something, you, took, you take a quick look at that title. If that title stands out to you for what you're really looking for, then you might read the description. But that's the first impression. You want to catch people's attention on this one sentence. You can't write a whole huge long line here. You have to catch their attention with a concise sentence. <coughs> You can click Learn More for more advice on that, and the SEO class that I teach gives us more in more detail. But my advice for the moment is, make this title include your keywords about your site. If you don't know what that means, well then that's what the SEO class is about. But in short, your website should have several keywords that define what it's about. That it is literally taking a piece of paper and writing all of these keywords that your site is about, and applying those keywords throughout your site in the method that we talk about in the SEO class. But those keywords, you want to apply them to your title. But there's a balancing act here. You don't want to do keyword stuffing, which is I've got 10 keywords, and I'm not going to force all of those 10 keywords on my title here. It's not going to be human readable. And the search engines now tell us, uh, optimize your site for people, and the search engines will then follow. So here, funny cat pictures with captions. So it's got the keyword that someone might have searched for funny cat captions. Your pictures. <coughs> and it's coming from example.com. So to edit this, you need to edit your website and find somewhere on your website where it says edit title. Edit page title. It's going to vary through all the software. You're going to need to find on your software, where do I edit my page title? And you should edit that for all of your pages. Yes, all 20 of your pages. Ed yes, all 60 of your pages. Yes, every page of your website should be optimized. If you've got 40 to work with, well, start on the most important ones. The home page, the products page. You decide what are the most important pages of your site. What are the pages you want to get the most traffic to, uh, you know, first choice. And then when you've done those, work through every page to get them all optimized. That's why if you hire an SEO company, they might charge you a lot because they're going to come at you with a variety of concepts. Just like uh, if you've got uh, work you need to do in your bathroom, you're going to pay for parts and labor. 
You're going to pay for that new sink and someone to install it. So with SEO, you're paying for that too, parts and labor. The parts are the concepts of writing the keywords, brainstorming it, thinking of a marketing plan, blah, blah, blah. And the labor is adding it to those 40 pages, making a sitemap, updating it, uploading it, and so forth. So the title information is in the, you find that from your outlay if you're hosting the website? You're, you're going to find that where how you're editing your website. This is the point about when you edit your website, somewhere you will see a, a place to add the title of your page. In addition to title, you're also going to look for, they call it the snippet, but you'll often see it seen written as description. So we have a title, we have a description. Often also called a meta title or a meta description. M-E-T-A, meta. So somewhere on your software you're going to need to edit your meta description, your snippet, because that's what's going to appear here. If I caught people's attention with my one sentence title, then I can further tell them you're going to click on the right place with my description here. The advice. Provide an accurate, succinct summary of the page's content in its meta description tag. Write informative and relevant content for the page's body. So that's, that's a twofer right there. It's telling you, in the description, write a short summary of what's on that page. But then on the page's body, which means on the page itself, write your relevant text. So like pmdinteractive.com. <clears throat> Um, oh, like this, PMD Interactive, here we go. So, for example, my site right here, uh, it shows uh, the title, PMD Interactive, and then it shows um, web marketers who can create the right solution for the right price. We offer everything from social media to human resources. So this is what you're going to, this is again putting your best foot forward. So it's telling you write accurate titles and snippets or descriptions. And then on the actual body, well, when you visit the body here, individual approach to every customer. We listen to your unique business needs and provide a design which guides your customers where you want them to go, and so forth. That's the, that's the actual body text. What do people see in the body? Here's a couple of blog posts. Sometimes you might see on a Google search result. These here what are called site links, which are deep links from your site. Sometimes that appears on a site that has a lot of complexity that appears. Well, I want that. I want these deep links to show up on my site as well. If you read the description here, site links are generated algorithmically or automatically depending on the website and the user query. You can't activate site links, so you can't do it. We just have to make sure that we have all the content relevant on our site. Google will analyze our site if we provide the site map, if we submit our site verify, etc. It will analyze it and it will decide. Let's add site links because you have so much content that we want to show in the best way possible. You might also see sometimes there's a search box inside of search. And if you read that again, we display it when we think it might help the user refine your search. So if you have lots and lots of blog posts on your site, you might then get a search box from your search results if Google analyzes your site and see, uh, deems it necessary. The URL. Organize your web page into a logical structure. You may also want to consider using breadcrumbs. I'll explain that in a moment. But here, it's also going to give a preview of your website address. 
So they chose to show the www version. That's what appears. You can choose then the the non www version, and that's what will appear. It says set up your your pages structure so that it's logical. There's a section called events. And then the San Francisco events, the San Diego events, the Las Vegas events. So there's organization in the address. That is something that you have to figure out individually for what works on your site. If I look at a blog post, there's this structure here. This is the site, and then there's the structure. This was published in 2015, the sixth month, the fifth day, and there's the title of that, of that post. I can look at the portfolio and then look at clients. And then the address will say PMD Interactive Portfolio, that client. So this is your structure that you set up on your site. The breadcrumbs are when you go and it says consider using them. So I might not show an example here. But let's say I go into, this would be a good place here to have it if we had it. We've gone from the home page down one level, which was portfolio, then down another level, which was this client. So sometimes you see websites that at the top they have a very simple sort of trail where you're at. It might say home, you know, arrow, portfolio, arrow, so on to that. Those are breadcrumbs. It's just a simple sort of link structure that you see on a page to guide people. Because if they want to go back one level, it'll be within the breadcrumb trail, and then they can go back that way. So it's just another way for people to navigate around on your page. And that's why I notice it says consider. It's not a requirement, but it's um, it might be useful. And then you can look up that article there about what are they and how to do them. Yes? Um, when, I, when I go into a website for, let's say, homedepot.com, look at products, then I get out of that and go to another site that has advertising. Home Depot is their advertising. So I notice that a lot when I'm navigating. So I'll go to my email, Hotmail, and there's homedepot.com. That has to do with site cookies. Home Depot has set up a cookie, which is a, a simple little file that is saved on your computer that tracks that, that tracks that you went throughout that website and did stuff. Then other websites might look at that cookie to then serve you those ads. So the reason you see that is because they're using cookies. Um, if you would like that, you would have to set up cookies on your site, which is a very technical thing, but you're seeing the result. There's a trail of what you've done going throughout the web, and then it kind of follows you. That's why people don't like that. They don't want to see that advertising following them. So you would go into your settings of your web browser, and somewhere there it would say, do not use cookies. And that should help you a little bit against that. You can also go to your web browser, and somewhere there's clear history and reset browser and such. There's ways to turn that off. And the newer browsers also have something. You've heard of the uh, do not call list for your phone number that is supposed to prevent the telemarketers from calling you. There's something like that, and it's the do not track list. And that's on your web browser. Some web browsers, somewhere in the settings, when you browse around, there's, there's, there might be the option right here. Send a do not track request with your browsing traffic. I found this. I'm using Google Chrome. If you're on a different browser, you'll have to find it somewhere. But on Google Chrome, I found it by going into that little menu on the top right, going to Settings. There's lots and lots of settings here, but there's a search. I searched in my settings for Track. and buried in the setting somewhere. In my case, it's not on. So then it's tracking me. Send do not track request. So it's kind of like the, the do not call phone number list. No email. 
that that has to do with just your web browsing, not your email. So as you browse different websites, you know, tell, you're telling them don't track me, so that you know we don't see ads on your on your browsing history. Oh, and here's an example of breadcrumbs. So it's on this website, some sort of dividers, subsection, subsection, subsection. And we've got these rich snippets. This is an event, and this is a product. This depends on your kind of site, and this takes a little bit of setup. But this is the example where this is an event. Something is going to happen at a certain day and time, so you might get that on a Google search if you set this up. So this is that you're going to click there and read how to do that using the data highlighter, and then we're telling Google, our site has rich snippets. Our site has content that I wanted to stand out. Not all content will work here. It'll tell us on, this, on the tutorial that it works for events, it works for products, and some other things. It doesn't work for everything, like our blog posts, for example. There's a lot of great information here. Most of it you probably did not know and it'll keep giving us more information, more data to keep learning about this. So I'm just going to close that window. Or any, any questions on this window, actually, before I leave? It's really things you can really be personally can affect like the title, the snippets, and the events, in terms of how we, where we, what we write, the content that we put in our website. The content, yes. Title, snippet, and rich snippets which would be event or product and other kinds. But you do have the control of your URL, depending how you set your site structure, you should be able to do that. And you have the control of breadcrumbs. We don't have the control of the site links and the search within a site. So on the left side, uh, I'm not going to look at every screen here, but on the left side, if you click that little triangle next to search appearance, we can look at different, um, different screens of data and such. But notice one that might be useful for you is HTML improvements. This is going to scan your website and tell you what could be improved on a technical level. Mine says we didn't detect any, so hopefully you didn't get any as well. If you did, then you're going to need to uh, read what's wrong and try to improve that, because if Google is telling you something's wrong, you should, you should listen. <clears throat> Inside of search traffic, open search traffic, click the triangle, and then let's look at mobile usability. Google is now making more a fuss about, is your site mobile friendly? Have you ever visited a website on your mobile device, and the text is really small, and you have to zoom in? That is a dead giveaway that that site is not mobile friendly. If you visit a website and it's nice, readable text, most likely it's mobile friendly. So if you have to tap to zoom in, or pinch to zoom in, or whatever, most likely it's not mobile friendly. And now Google takes that as one of their signals um, to pay attention to, to rank your site. They don't say exactly a percentage and how important in all of this. It's one of the many signals. They've got like 200 signals that they pay attention to on a site, all these trade secrets. But they've told us, they've told the, the SEO community recently, we're going to start paying attention more and more to mobile-friendly websites. So if we visit this site, and we see some issues that we might want to fix, we might want to fix them. So apparently there's one page with some issues. Um, you should be able to click to give you the detail of which particular page it is. Oh, okay, that particular site. So, um, yeah, so that particular page on the site has that issue. Okay, now I know about it. Now I'm going to go fix it. I would never have known about this unless I had set up Google Search Console.
This was recently detected. We've got this section on crawl, and that'll give us a lot of um, this will give us a lot of information, um, like crawl errors. Are there broken links? Uh, so you see here on this particular report, for a time there were 45 errors, and it would tell you what the error error is, and then those were fixed, and then so it's possibly detecting other error, errors. It was at 45 and now it's at 9. So I need to go in here. This is what I'm saying. Once a month, log in and check this. Uh, check as many of these screens as you, as you can <clears throat> so that you can get the full picture of what Google sees. And then fix the results. So here, 12 results. And when they were detected, so that one there, there seems to be a broken link there. Um, so all of that's going to be broken. This is going to shoot up a lot because we've moved this whole section to another part of the site and we need to fix that. So how do we fix it? We fix it on the server. We come back to Google Search Console, select the item, and say Mark is fixed. This, of course, works on the Honor system because I could select to fix all of these right now and not do anything on my site. And say, great, Google will say, great, you fixed it. But it's going to check my site and it's going to find those errors and it's going to come back again. So you don't just want to select mark as fixed, you actually want to fix those issues and then mark them. You should be able to click to give you more information. Again, you might not be really seeing a lot, you just set this up. As you let this run and crawl your site, you'll get this information. Googlebot couldn't crawl this URL because it points to a non-existent page. Generally 404s don't harm your performance in search but you can use them to in help improve user experience. So who knows, they might decide to change that and say, generally 404 errors do harm your performance, so please fix them. Google can change the rules whenever they want. It's We're playing in their playground. If we don't want to play in their playground, then, then don't care about what they say here. Don't, uh, don't listen to their advice and such. But Google is the largest search engine. It has more than 60% traffic globally. Billions of searches are done every day with it. And there are alternatives, of course. Bing Search, Yahoo Search, AOL Search. Those are around and those are competitors. Bing has recently reached about 20% market share. Yes, 20% is much lower compared to 60%, but that's still billions of searches. So in my SEO class, I also address Bing. We have Bing Webmaster Tools like Google Webmaster Tools. So if you educate yourself with Bing Webmaster Tools, you can connect your site to Bing as well to take care, to follow all of this traffic and advice and everything. Obviously this is advanced Google, but you can figure it out or take the SEO class and we go through it together. And those are the two I would focus on. If you're going to do SEO, focus on Google and Bing. Yes, there's Yahoo, but Yahoo gets a lot of their traffic already from Bing. So if you optimize for Bing, you're optimizing for Yahoo. And then the other ones are just even smaller blips on the radar, AOL search, Lyco search, etc. Yes, they get millions of searches, but if you target Google and Bing, you're getting over 80. Uh, no, you're getting yeah, you're getting over 80% of the market. Lots and lots of search. What is the download button for? You can look at this data right here on the website, or you can click download and download it as an Excel spreadsheet. And then as that spreadsheet, I can mark annotations, I can color code things, I can make notes. Um, so it gives you a C technically a CSV file, which is a spreadsheet, and then I can open it in Excel or whatever, or numbers on the Mac, and work with it that way. So this is going to tell you errors on the desktop, more and more people are using smartphones. So according to this, on the smartphone, I don't have any soft errors there, but I do have six not found. Notice this is as I went in 
as my company went in to go in and fix those issues, it said, okay, we don't have as many issues. <coughs> so that's good. Crawl stats. Uh, no, I mean uh, fetch as Google. This is an important one, and, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Fetch as Google. This will let. Th this is like the old the old term would be like um, submit your site to Google. Um, there used to be this this form when when the web was young and and uh, Google started off. You would add your you would add your site to Google. Um, the way we've been doing it so far is the modern way, but we still have this where let's say. Google has crawled our site and indexed it, and then we add a brand new section, brand new products and such. We can then tell Google, hey, look at our brand new content. So if I've got a brand new page here, I can then, uh, we've got fetch, fetch and render. I recommend fetch and render. That means Google will now, at this moment, go look at your site and see, okay, what's new? What we told it it'll then render that, it'll process it, and then the next button will be submit to submit to, to Google. It will, it will then be added to Google. So this is a faster way to add yourself to, to the Google index. And we've got the desktop version and different smartphone versions. So recently we've migrated the, the server. So therefore here it's saying, okay, there's a redirection here. It used to be on this server with this IP address, now it's on that one. It's not a, it's not a, a big problem. I just need to go in and tell it, okay, fetch the latest version, and then I'll have a button that says submit, and then it'll, it'll be all good. So this is from our recent server migration. The point is here. This is one of your tasks. Eventually, you're gonna come here. You're going to first submit the main address, fetch and render, it'll process it, it'll say all good, and then submit. So even though you've added a sitemap perhaps, this is still a good idea to, to do because it will then again further define you in the Google search and I want to get found. I don't need to go in and, and then tell it every single one of my pages. If I make a if I add a new page or make a big change to a page, I could do fetch and render and then submit. It's the faster way to um, add my content to the Google search. And most of these screens have some sort of learn more, which I would recommend you check. Yes. And it's telling me, it's getting this new pop-up, and it's telling me that um, I can either crawl from the latest URL or crawl, crawl the URL and direct links. And it's giving me feedback about the options it crawls. Telling me this, and I have so many submissions remaining for my quota. Or yeah, I so Google, it's giving me a different option on my so-called quota. Can you tell me more about that? So you're going to have these quotas where you have per month how many you can submit. So that's why this is a way to prevent the abuse, not to add something over and over and over. So you have a limit to how many times you can submit, depending what option you chose there. And the two options were crawl this address only or crawl the sublinks. Is that what I call it? So I would say if there's a, if, if I'm adding a brand new page, pmdinteractive.com, new product, I would click the option of just crawl this page because that's the newest page that I've added. But as the very first crawl here, I would tell it to crawl my whole site and sublinks. I want it to follow those links that are on that page. And that's what that is doing. Go to every link connected. And as a first time, that's a good thing to do. Subsequent times, if you're adding just individual pages, you just simply need to select that one page. The other pages have been already crawled.
So we'll look at one more thing, then we'll take a break. Uh, or two more things. Um, here, under search traffic, we have links to your site. This is going to be a listing of other people's websites that link to your website. And in modern SEO, an important factor, a signal that Google looks at is how many other websites link to your website. Um, and I give the metaphor that if you, if you ever wrote term papers and such in high school or big advanced research papers in college, especially in college, let's say you wrote your 10-page paper and uh, you submit it. Uh, what's that last page that is required on a term paper? Your works cited page? The page that you said where you got your information from. What happens if you turn in your project without a works cited? You get an automatic F, most likely. Because you might be brilliant, but you did not invent all of this knowledge. You synthesized it from a variety of sources. That's the point of the work cited. You got this knowledge, you took it from other places, but you put it in your words, you expanded upon it, you synthesized it. You're standing on the shoulders of giants. So in academia, you, you have your work cited. You chose those works because they bolstered your position, they added to your research, etc. They were good resources. In a sense, this is sort of what Google is looking at. If your site has a bunch of links from other people's websites to your site, you're kind of being cited. You're being part of that works cited. If some other website links to my site, and that other website, and that other website, the search engines will see that, those connections, and that could help you rank higher. If you have no links to your site, that means no one's linking to you, no one cares about you, why would Google care about you? So that term, it's different terms, links to your site, backlinks, incoming links, inbound links, links to your site. Those are important for modern SEO. Question. Or something that's, uh, that's, yes, that's useful. A forum, blog posts, other, uh, other ways to get links, but there's a, that's a deeper discussion for the SEO class because um, an old technique, um, which is not relevant anymore, is I could go to GoDaddy and buy 10 sites and link all my sites together. And in the old days, that would work. Hey, I've got backlinks. But now the search engines are smarter, and they're going to see, well, why is this, sh why is this website about nutrition linking to this website about dog walking? Why is this website about technology linking to this one about raising a family? You know, the, the concepts of those sites don't relate, so their links don't relate. If I'm a cooking website, I want links from other cooking-related, food-related websites to link to my website. That's what the search engines are going to see and like, and that's why they're going to rank you higher. So again, that's a big can of worms. In the SEO class, we talk more in detail. But yeah, links from other people's websites that you do not control are the best kinds of links. And on this screen, it would show us. Southwestern College is linking to this website. That's a good link. Uh, we do not have access to that. We do not control it. And um, the more links you have from other people's websites, the better. This is where you look that up. Mm-hmm. It does, and it is helpful. Um, but again, the links that you do not control are the best ones. So more links that you get, better. But um, links that you do not control are the best. And so I don't doubt, they're already doing it probably, but they're going to increase. The search engines are going to keep more track of what social media links you have. It's becoming so important. Social media is a way to generate traffic. So it's a trade secret. How much do social media links currently matter? but I'm sure it's going to increase as time goes on. 
this is the last thing we'll look at, then we'll take a break. Um, search analytics. Under search traffic, search analytics. We can get these charts here to see what are some keywords that have appeared on a Google search related to your site. Remember I said previously to do well in SEO, in search engine optimization, you need to develop a keyword strategy. And so here is one way to do that also. This is sort of, however, a catch-22. You might not get traffic until you've got your keywords, but you don't know what keywords until you've gotten traffic. So that's why <coughs> SEO is a long-term thing. If, if any company tells you, you're going to rank number one in a week, in a month, run away from them, because no good SEO company should tell you a definitive deadline of when you're going to rank highly. They're going to be using most likely techniques that on the short run will help you, but in the long run will not, and maybe even hurt you. So what I'm saying here is that Google is currently telling me these are some keywords that have happened naturally from people searching. So that could help me figure out that, okay, people are searching for Davco Grout. How can I apply that keyword more effectively in my social media, on my website, in my blog posts? And you probably have zero on all of this, and that's okay. You just started off. Again, it's a catch-22. You won't see this data <coughs> until you've set this up and let it run, but then you won't see data unless you've got traffic. But I want traffic, so I need keywords. But I don't know my keywords because I don't have traffic. So. But that's why you develop a keyword strategy yourself, apply it to your site, and then looking here, is it working? Are those keywords appearing? Are other keywords appearing to further develop my strategy? So you should look at the other screens here. There's usually a learn more button to learn more. We're going to take uh, our, our next break, and when we come back then, we'll, we'll talk about more advanced Google, Google Analytics and such, and um, we'll set that up. So let's take a break. It's 8.07. We'll be back at 8.08. We'll go on. <laughs>